Thank you so much. Honorees, honorable ministers, premiers, friends. First of all, I want to express my deepest thanks and appreciation to uh, my good friends, all my good friends that appeared on the video and said uh, such kind uh, words and uh, they were most gracious. Thank you so much. I'm apparently the, uh, the person that is neither right, nor left, nor center. <laughs> but uh, I get to see the ice pretty good. Right? <laughs> and actually pretty versatile. I can play either position if need be. But uh, quite an honor. Thank you so much. Uh, I, of course, would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the uh, Mississaugas of New Credit, those traditional lands where we are gathered here this evening. Uh, on your behalf, uh, I say thank you to those good people. I receive this honor with deep gratitude and great humility. It is an award that you have given to me as an individual but it speaks to our highest aspirations as First Nations peoples, that we are not mere prisoners of fate. Our actions matter, our issues matter, and the more we are recognized as important and relevant to all matters of public policy, the more we can bend history in the direction of justice. I stand on the shoulders of so many women and men who toil unrecognized to all but those they help to relieve the suffering and poverty of First Nations peoples. Their quiet acts of courage and compassion inspire me to do what I do. They are more deserving of this honor than I. For they are in the trenches, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians alike working to achieve equality and justice for survivors of residential schools, for hundreds of disappeared Aboriginal women, for Aboriginal children who continue, continue to be placed in state care at a rate of 25 times that of the on Aboriginal population, for decent housing on reserves, for clean water, and for a fair share of Canada's resources to educate and employ the next generation so our young men and women don't end up in gangs, prisons, and on the welfare rolls. Because of their efforts, commerce, both economic and social, is beginning to stitch our country and the First Nations together. Thousands have been lifted from poverty over the past 50 years, while the ideals of liberty, self-determination, equality, and the role of law have slowly but surely advanced to benefit us in ways our ancestors could only dream of. This legacy is one for which all Canadians can be rightfully proud. Yet much work needs to be done. I do not have a definitive solution to the problems we face. What I do know is that meeting these challenges will require the same vision hard work and persistence of those men and women who have acted so boldly in the past. If, if for no other reason, we Canadians must embrace these challenges out of enlightened self-interest. Because as we seek a better future for our First Nations children and grandchildren, we ensure that the lives of all Canadians will be better. We know full well from the lessons of our shared history that pent-up grievances fester and grow. Persistent poverty, forced assimilation, and the suppression of self-determination can and has led to all sorts of crises. But we also know that the opposite is true. First Nations have proven that they can flourish when given their fair share of our country's resources and real opportunities to control their own destinies. But it is undoubtedly true 
that development rarely takes root without security. Security does not exist where people do not have access to enough food or adequate housing, clean water, or the health care they need to survive in dignity. Security does not exist where children cannot aspire to a decent education or a job that supports a family. The absence of hope can rot a society from within. Suicides, addictions, violence, and senseless criminality are symptoms of societies that have lost hope. Canada's interests will never be served by the denial of human aspirations. Let me also say this. One of the lessons I have learned over the years is that the advancement of our cause cannot simply be about making demands, as fair and just as they may be. It must be coupled with the thoughtful and careful diplomacy and negotiations. I know that engagement with those who, who, who oppress or run roughshod over others is not as satisfying as indignation. But I also know that criticism without outreach and condemnation without discussion can result in crippling stalemates. Forging a new path is much easier when there are open doors. That new path for Canada and First Nations imagines agreements with all levels of the public and private sectors, strong, vibrant First Nation and Aboriginal communities, support for human rights, investments in our development. All of these are vital ingredients in bringing about the progress we so desperately need. All are achievable if a common sense of commitment and respect exists. At the end of the day, the understanding that we all basically want the same things, that we all hope for the chance to live, our, live out our lives with some measure of happiness and fulfillment for ourselves and our families. It is this understanding that will carry us forward to a brighter, more hopeful future. By deciding to recognize me with this award, the Public Policy Forum demonstrates their fidelity to this principle. For it is, all, for it is and always has been the story of human progress. For that, I am deeply grateful. Miigwech, thank you.